Um, I'll make them quick. Um, one is I, uh, my, my father-in-law has a, um, a tennis, he's a tennis coach in Australia. And he's been asking me for a long time to get this site up. It's, um, it's, um, the, he, he bought like the rights to Australia's distribution for this company called Snower. It's an old tennis brand, um, that they they're they're reviving it's an italian brand and um so he, he owns the distribution for our australia which is like kind of cool and we're not really sure how big of a thing it'll be but um so they need a website and it's it's not really like the driving force so it's a pretty dinky little thing that they just need they need the products listed and stuff and we'll get a few sales here and there um so what i did is i, I basically said like i'm not going to build anything for anyone unless I can use Tina because <laughs> it just is not worth my time anymore. Um, so this is using Tina um, and Shopify, um, but it's it's what it's doing is like, I have a little script that, that downloads the products into Markdown from Shopify and I just run that. And there's like 10 products right now, so it's not a big deal. Um, and so it just downloads like the main information. Um, it doesn't download any inventory or anything like that. It's just like the products. Um, and it's using Remix. That, so there's kind of two interesting things here. It's using Remix and it's using sort of Shopify, but it's not, re it's cheating on the Shopify thing. It's like downloading into Markdown and then treating as, like Tina doesn't even know that it's Shopify, you know? Um, so um, the, oh, there's three things actually. There's those, and then um, it's using our search, which I think is working pretty nicely. Um, I'm using like Tailwind's UI, so I don't really have to do much here. Um, but this is like just using our our um, our filters, and so uh, I've created these these categories and stuff on on the Markdown files. Um, and it, I was really pleased with how nice it is. Um, just using stuff like this right here, I think I I think that's really it. Um, I've got product line and category, and um, Within brackets, there's there's like different, like there's a Vita, Vitas, you know, three different types. And um, and yeah, so this is doing just like an HTML request uh, of this, and it's using these URL query parameters for, for it. Um, and it works really nicely. So I is don't that actually have any balls yet. Like dynamic or static? Like how is that? Is it actually hitting the database? Well, right now it's, it, right now it's local, but yeah, it it's um it's it's not pre-generating that query at all. It's um mm -hmm. I don't even remember. So this is a remix, so I just get confused here. Can um, you pop up, pop up your font size a little bit, Jeff? Thanks. So is this I'm not sure, I guess I'm sharing the right screen. Okay. Um yeah, so it's using our connection, it's using our client, and it's just getting the 10. I mean. I don't know. That's kind of weird. I haven't implemented pagination yet. I don't even know why I did that. Oh, I did that so I could reverse the order. I don't know if this is working. Sorry, let me. I don't know if I've implemented this yet. Go to high. I don't know. I don't think I did. I don't think I've implemented that yet. Um, no, it doesn't even change the URL. Um, maybe I did get order. Sorry. I don't, I don't really remember where I left off here. Um, yeah, I did. I just didn't put it, I haven't wired it up to this, this drop down yet, but um, I will. Um, so price is in there as well. So price on the, um, in there. So yeah, I don't know. I thought, I thought it was really nice. And like, I think back to um, when, what was it? Uh, it was like a Next.js, Vercel was like promoting something. And they were, I think I remember Scott, you relaying like Guillermo was complaining that it was really hard to just add a page like this in the Jamstack like space, markdown powered stuff. It's just like not like a no-go, um, which for us is like not a problem at all because we're basically in, in this context, we are contentful, we are sanity, you know, we're, we're in the same boat as them and we offer pretty decent filters. Um, I think, it can be really good. Um, I just wanted to experiment with it and, and I was really pleased with how nicely it came together. Um, and then, I don't know, uh, 
yeah, it all kind of works nicely. Oh, I'll show the edit state of this, obviously. I'm using the iframe, and this is at an iframe version that is a little bit, um, by the way, uh, Remix also doesn't need the index.html. Um, so that's nice. This is going to be buggy. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's really nice to like, I was talking to Scott about this and I was just saying like, it feels really nice to edit like e-commerce with this. Um, I didn't do the images yet. They're just like hard coded or they're just, you know, strings. Um, but I don't know, it all just kind of works. So this is like still a much, very much a work in progress, but using Remix was great. It was totally the same as, um, as Tina, like in, in Remix, you do, um, you have a loader function. So this is basically get server side props. Remix doesn't have a concept of static build. So there's no like equivalent to get static props. Um, and I think we can totally lean into that. I, I, I think that, that that's that's fine. Uh, it doesn't really affect us at all. Um, especially now that we're doing like, when you're, when you're on cloud, you're talking to Tina or when you're on host, you're always talking to, um, you know, Tina Cloud, that that just sort of like everything kind of works. Um, so it's it's very similar. Use loader data instead of getting it from props, and everything else is the same. It has no, it's just not even next specific or anything like that. And then because we're not wrapping the site anymore, like this is all just like there's no. This is the only, you know, we're because of the query we're using Tina for for data fetching. There's more Tina code in here. We're using the, the client here. But this is the only API for contextual editing that we have. Um, and one of the things I talked about was with Remix is that you could have a scenario where you have to use Tina hooks because the way this is laid out is that this is in routes, products, product ID, use Tina. But at some point here, I'm gonna add, um, I've got these navigation pieces, which are still hard coded, I guess. Um, at some point, I'm going to add um, the use team hook here for navigation so you can control this stuff. So that will be like nested multiple use Tina hooks. And in theory, they could have two, they could have the same forms. And I think right now, and I haven't even tested it, it's just like me thinking through it. It's like, I'm pretty sure what would happen is like, the navigation loads, let's say it loads Grinta 100 in here for some reason, like we're showing the image here or something. Um, what will happen is when the, when these are both loading, we've loaded Grinta form, and now the, this use Tina foot hook thinks it controls that form, and so does this one. So when we leave this page, I'm pretty sure we'll lose it in both places. Um, it's not a big deal. I don't think it's going to be a hard thing to fix. It's just like that. Just not. We've never really designed the use Tina hook for this. Um, so we just need to basically say this form belongs to this query and this query. You know, um, we need to just add a little bit of metadata so that we don't unmount a form that we um, that we don't need to unmount. So that's that's uh, that's pretty much it. Some bugs, um, but these are all fixed in the punch list uh, PR right now. This is awesome. So the Shopify, it's, you're almost like hitting it, if I understand correctly, hitting the Shopify API and scraping the data and pumping it into Markdown files? Um, yes, I I moved the script that I have, but um, it's real simple. It's just using the GraphQL API from Shopify and and, and um, taking a subset of the products or of the items from the, from the product in Shopify. Oh, and then we're using local images. So like, I don't know, we can go in, into the weeds about how the best do this. Like it definitely doesn't make sense to use. If you want two-way integration here where you want to update to go back to Shopify, Scott, Scott and I talked about this earlier this week. I was like, well, we could do like a hook and like a GitHub action that's like for Shopify and Tina, which would be kind of cool. Or we had also talked about like, well, aren't we just getting towards like, uh, you know, third-party integrations where this doesn't happen statically. This just happens through like some sort of federating, like, you know, this product, maybe we skip Tina Cloud or, or we go through Tina Cloud or, or you know, so like, 
there's all sorts of ways we could go with integration, but I, this is really simple. And the nice thing about Tina is like at the end of the day, if you can get your files into Markdown or JSON, then you can you can use it. And I don't know, there's a lot of tooling around doing that kind of stuff. So um, Tina is very friendly in that way. And I, I think it's like always like, it's just so nice to always have that as an escape hatch. If you like change the price in Tina, like are you using like the Shopify buy button? Is that like, does that price get reflected back into Shopify or? No, that's, I, I haven't done that yet. Um, but I would, I, in my implementation, not not to say this is the way that we would want to do it for Shopify for like in general, but I would like to have a GitHub action on my on my repo that just whenever things get merged into main, it just kicks out updates to Shopify. Yeah, you know, uh, okay. totally rudimentary implementation. But right now, it's like a script that I just run every now and then, and I read. And yeah. the write has no story yet. I need to I need to update the script so that it you know does the same the other direction. Yeah, right now it's a read script. You, you could use a GitHub action to make it a read write script. Yeah, but the nice thing about that, um, especially the writing back, is I would probably just use our client, and because our client has mutation support as well. Um, well, I mean, I guess I actually I don't know if this one does anymore. It, it did. I think we only do queries now, but we can still use GraphQL um, because I'm just writing to, to the local markdown and then I'll push it. Um, and our, we'd, our need, we'd need some sort of, because uh, the client uses the read-only token, right? Unless you're logged in, would we need like a write token? Um, well, what I'm saying is that the action, the GitHub action would do it. So like we would update we update our markdown files and then um, like those just go to whatever, um, but the action wouldn't be talking to Tina Cloud or anything. It would, the action would be talking from, from GitHub oh, Actions to Shopify. I see, right. I yeah. said that backwards. I, I, I mixed up what I was saying, so. Um, I don't know. There's like lots of lots of plot holes here. Uh, I mean, like the inventory, for example, you gotta get that from Shopify, and the whole shop button isn't even isn't even implemented yet. So, um, so it, it's the GitHub action would query Shopify, and update the con the collection in the repo, commit, yeah. That, and yeah, okay. That's yeah. it. Sounds similar to what I was thinking about with the YouTube playlist thing, where it fetches from YouTube updates and commits. Yeah. And and I Scott and I were talking about it, and that's definitely like not, you know, you look at Sanity's integrations for these types of things, and it's like way more. You're talking when you hit the API, you, you're hitting the live data of that integration rather than this like third party step. Um, and Scott and I were talking kind of in circles, like, well, you know, for Shopify that would make sense as an integration potentially where we like, you know, cause we've got to add support for that. And however we do it, like, I don't know, Kelly, what you would think, but like some version of our, our config says for, you know, for this collection, pass right through whatever header you've got, you, you've got to send a Shopify header off header of some sort and, or, or we orchestrate that or whatever, but like, you know, we we're just more or less a proxy, go back to Shopify, get it, come back. And we don't know anything about it. That has all sorts of implications for like, well, if you got a product collection and you got a page collection, that page collection can't reference the product collection probably because you got a foreign key now, which is in a different domain. And so how to, you know, like there's all sorts of like discussions to have there. And, and there's a really good story for Shopify specifically and any, any e-commerce integration, which has got like a great, just like, we can probably build something really nice. But then also there's another like conversation here, which is like, okay, you, YouTube playlist, we don't, know or care about that. And it's just cool that we can maybe build some patterns here, which is like, here's an action for, for the YouTube playlist thing, but it's the principle is the same, you know, listen to this webhook from YouTube or listen to this webhook from Shopify and run this script and use all of our tooling to write, write some markdown and um, you're good to go. It's, it's sort of like a jam stacky approach and it comes with, definitely comes with trade-offs.
uh, but it's like very open um, to the to everything. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel my feeling is is like your your solution is a simple solution, and it it would be like good for a lot of maybe smaller use cases where it's like you're not worried about inventory really. You're not worried if it's like the price isn't synced to the second, you know, with your mm -hmm. markdown file and Shopify, like, you know, most e-commerce stores that you people might work on, th this would be a really adequate solution. But if you're like, I don't know, big company X and you depend on your e-commerce store, you might want the direct integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just, it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge, um, like scale issue for us is because we, with that integration, we are on the hook for that work, you know, more or less. Um, mm -hmm. Unless we open up that, unless we open up our API to be, you know, once we get self-hosting, that may be a different story where we just have hooks on the back end and you can, you know, do the integration yourself. Um, so. Great for any like digital store, I guess, where you don't have inventory, you just kind of yeah, yeah. I don't know. Stuff well but me. even even the inventory thing like you there this isn't to say you can't use shopify it's just it gets into like some edge cases where you can manage the inventory yourself but then what happens on the product list page if you don't want to return anything that's out of stock because i've you know i filtered and and we want 10 results but the eighth result is out of stock so we actually just filtered that out post you know in the post filter um, so now you got, you know, nine results instead of 10 or, you know, stuff like that, that's weird and, and just wrong. Um, there's just a, probably a moving, uh, you know, but it just depends on who you are and how much you care about that kind of stuff. And, but you can, I mean, you know, you can certainly still use the Shopify API, you know. And the other thing actually is like also, I mean, you might even just you might even just use it for you might still use the Shopify API for for that list query as well. You might use it for for um, driving. Uh, I don't know what happened here. Uh, oh, I did kill that. Um, for driving this page too, but but at the end of the day, if you get the ID from Shopify, maybe all you care about is editing your content with Tina. So you could still have you could you could dr drive all of your data fetching and all of your stuff with the Shopify's API, but Shopify's uh, body field for the product description is terrible. You couldn't put MDX in there because they don't know what that is. So you could have our you could just leverage, you could sort of hydrate your product with with our content. You know what I mean? So you get the product ID from Shopify, but then you fetch that data from Tina. Um, stuff like that that you could do. And you can do all sorts of stuff, but um, you know, maybe that's a maybe that's a more mature integration there. But then that comes with using both clients and you know authenticating with Shopify and stuff. James, would you use an approach like this for Aco Saco? Um yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um yeah, so let's see it's kind of i it? use snip Cart and i do any inventory management like whenever we sell it i just go into snip Cart and you know i go into the, our markdown file and like toggle it off i guess how so, do you spell that uh yeah the, yeah c there a w k o s o c k o oh like a sock <laughs> makes sense yeah dot com yeah a very good uh, SEO, I guess. I don't know. I might have. Um... Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't even know my own website. Uh, co sockco.com. So sockco <laughs> just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. Oh, oh, is it down? Go sockco dot. Oh, sorry. Aco sock sock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's okay. There you go. I knew it when I typed it, it, it but as soon as I, I typed uh, it in, it popped right up. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we use a uh, snip carrot in there. Carrot thing. So this is this here is probably you probably have a medium and a small that's not showing up. Um, yeah, not for this design. So each 
each okay. sock is a markdown file and then i have like a front matter field that's uh sizes so this one has like the list item yeah yeah i think i would totally use something like that uh snip cart or um that shopify integration i think Yeah. It, uh, it's just it's tough for us to talk about stuff like that because it's like it works so it's so cool for that first 80 percent and you'd be like sweet 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 and then you're like oh wait okay hang on i need yeah. to configure my storefronts or you know just like we got to be careful probably about how we talk about stuff like that but um i don't know yeah it's definitely like niche i think because you'd have to really want to geek out over it i would say to dive into that maybe but if you're looking, you know, if you think about our the people using Kina, like a lot of them are geeking out over the stuff and customizing things, and like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people might find if we share this, say, with the solution with other folks, a lot of people might might be happy to do the same thing, even though it may not be perfectly future proof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the they it doesn't if in some ways they would probably prefer it to be, I mean, some of our users seem like they would prefer it to be a little bit hacky where you have to do some other stuff around it than to totally rely on this integration where it's a lot of magic being done behind the scenes. And at that point you need to rely on, um, you know, the company Tina cloud. And, um, yeah. yeah. Um, I do have one other quick thing to show. I know uh, I just, uh, it, well, are we over time? Are we? I'm good to keep going. If anybody else isn't, you feel free to bounce. This is being recorded. I just want to show the, because I know we talked about the URL bar and I, I got something working that I think is just going to be good for a while, which is to just extend this URL uh, to match the user's URL. Um, so I have taken out the URL bar entirely and whatever your URL is, is just going to be appended to, to preview. Um, I almost thought like would there be a scenario where I think James you mentioned maybe maybe even the preview is at the root of the admin, at which point it would just be anything after the hash is your URL. Um, but anyway, this this is like my my big thing on the URL bar is like you got to know where you are, um, and we had to have some some sort of representation, and um, I think we're not there yet maybe with the actual UI, and this is sort of like I don't know an easy win for us is just um, doing it this way. This is awesome. I think, what do you guys think? Sorry, what's different? It's just the... Um, it's just that the URL the, of your website is now reflected in the iframe. Um, do you... Do you need the the preview if you're using the hash like that? Would well, you? the preview is just our as our router. So like we have admin here. So we could we could put that at the root, but right now it's a preview. Okay. Okay. Um, and I don't know exactly know what we would want to do. Like if if you had a Hugo site, yeah, you know, like I was thinking it would be kind of cool if this is just this, you know, anything after the hash is your site. Um, but mm -hmm then that means the root of the admin is the preview, which maybe is what we want for non, you know, for contextual editing, maybe that is what we want. Um, like you just land on, on the admin and you're, and you're actually at your site, you know? I don't know what you mean by that. Like this URL is our iframe, yeah. but maybe it should just be this. Look, admin is our single page app and, and you can kind of ignore that because a lot of implementations won't need it. But we do need this hash. And then anything after this is going to be like your URL pattern. Yeah, my feeling is less is more. What do you guys think? Yeah, no, this is sweet. So what would you do to get to the admin if we made that change? Just the oh, you, you would just go, you would still get to the admin here. Okay. It, yeah, that's a good question. Like, would you have to then go to admin? 
right. which is weird. So preview is the one, you, this is root, you know, and right now um, we put preview at the non root. But then all these URLs, like, what? what is this? Is this like, yeah, you know, or I mean, actually, I think James, you said it too, is like this view doesn't do anybody any good. So maybe it doesn't exist even. It's just the home page by default or. Yeah, but then, but then it's confusing because then you see this, like, you don't know, you, I don't know. Is that more confusing for contextual editing? Like, oh, hang on. Here. Is what more confusing for contextual editing? Like, if if this URL here was how you got to the preview, then how do you get to this? Like, how do you get to this view here? Does just see like the real estate of Tina's admin? You know, I don't know if we need this view. Yeah, are you suggesting maybe replace this view with what you just showed us on this? This page. Well, well, yes. And then the, the question I think is like, what is the default of this? Because if that is the case, then do you want to know that this is here? You know? Or does it show up like this? And you're like, where is every like what am I supposed to do now? Or because I think by default it'll 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 show up like this. Let me see. Yeah, so like, this is, this is what we want. You can still get to all this stuff. Um, My feeling is I mean, that's, that's ideal. What do you think, Scott? Yeah, I think that's kind of ideal. I think we could also default to like a wider width for the sidebar. I think one of the early issues that we ran into is that if the sidebar defaulted to anything bigger it might make your site look messed up because right because you know breakpoints weren't yeah so with the iframe i think like we could potentially push the uh the default width but i mean i really i don't know i think it's really cool um so we could like oh yeah, man it really needs a lot of width there it does i don't know yeah, maybe we can maybe we can reduce that. Cause like yeah, you have to be on a like I could switch over to my other screen, but it's not sharing. Like I'm on my I'm on my large monitor here, so it's it's no no problem to just land here like this. That looks great, um, but but doesn't look more crappy on 1,200 pixels or something, you know. Oh, and are you trying to are you trying to show the sidebar navigation along with the form? I was just saying, like, what would it look like if we did? Um, yeah. Just so it's not hidden away, is that? Not. Yeah, just so it's, yeah, exactly. So it's like sort of obvious. I don't even know. What do we want? What, what's like a standard desktop, 1400 or something? Or is it like way bigger these days? I can't even change it. That sounds right to me, but I'm not sure. So. I can't click on that one under this stupid view. I don't know. Anyway, that that would be that would be my concern. Um, is this is not very discoverable, but at the same time, it it's kind of nice because it feels like you didn't really. It just feels like intentional that you went to add it to edit. Um, but yeah, then also it, it's it very much out of your way. Yeah, it it show it showcases the Tina's strength right off the bat. Now, what happens if you're using Tina in basic mode and there is no preview? Yeah, I mean we can do that because what we do is um I mean, this view can still exist. If we don't, all that's driven is by like this little preview prop. Um we just pass um I don't even know where it is. We pass this this preview here, and um, we could we could detect if no collections have the router property. 
I mean, for a Hugo site, you'd still see your site. You just wouldn't be able, you wouldn't see a form. You know, was that weird? Definitely seems weird. This would be just blank. Yeah, something to think about anyway. Yeah, because yeah, the only way we know if you're doing visual editing is if you have your route mapper or your router property on your collection. Can we make that a config option? Yeah, we could. I'm just yeah, just thinking it loud here. But... Yeah, I mean it's pretty. It's pretty simple. We wanted to just put something on it, or maybe we make it you know falsy or something. You know, like you have to opt out of it instead of opt into it or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Although, like, if you didn't if you didn't set up a router for it, like, you you're not going to get anything out of it anyway. So maybe it does need to be opt in, so you know actually what you're doing. Because like, you need to you need to provide for anything to happen, to anything to work at all. You need to provide this property here. So we could look at every collection and say, do they have this property? And if they if they have it on any of them, then then we'll we'll turn it on. Yeah. I don't know. Is it, does anybody have any arguments against making that preview the default experience when you get into the admin uh, at the with the URL of just hashtag slash like admin dot in, in sorry admin slash index HTML hashtag slash is there any reason not to do that? Yeah, I think it. I think it feels better for this case of this um, contextual editing site. I am just wondering how it would work, how it would work with Hugo sites or sites that are kind of like a hybrid of some sites are contextual, some sites aren't. I mean, maybe it's easy. Maybe it is easier for us to offer a flag that says visual editing false or something. Yeah. It might also be just like a good talking point. It's like for Hugo, turn off visual editing, or else you'll get like, yeah, um, some iframe logic. Or I mean, or else like because you're not. Maybe we don't have to explain what will happen, but just like, um, disable visual editing because you don't need it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I the homepage that we have now, I don't think is very useful. I did yeah. kind of envision like in the future, maybe there's a bit more there, like it kind of could show some recent activity on the project or some different users or prompt you to kind of like add new users or kind of like uh, a checklist type thing. Um, but yeah, we don't have that stuff yet. I mean, so. that could still be, a, yeah, that could still be a, uh, a feature uh, somewhere yeah like dashboard link or something like that yeah. in here um yeah but I, yeah i feel like it's i agree Jane, that agree that that stuff's good but when i like whenever i i recall like building a wordpress site or using a different cms for clients and stuff in the past that dashboard landing page like never got used it's full of junk that nobody cared about. Like they just want to edit content. So I feel like yeah. like simple is powerful. And yeah, I mean, this is this is totally this isn't even like an architecture change. You know, it's just it's just discussing like we if we decide that that doesn't make sense, then we will just go back to this. Um, it's not like a it's just a little like code change. Mm -hmm. um, but I I definitely. I still like think there's a world where I would love like some sort of sort of power URL bar thingy. Um, but especially with our time constraint, this feels it's it satisfies my my needs. And then the other thing I was like I was showing was like um in the in the Snowart site I just had where I had that that product list, 
that had like query parameters and stuff like that, like that all that all just gets appended and Remix doesn't care. So like this could be, you know, it could be like query equals or whatever. Um, and I, I think that will, will go pretty well. Now, if you get into your own world where your website has very complex URL logic, like what if you have a hash router? Um, I kind of think it all works, but I, I don't know. <laughs> I am pretty like Remix just ignores everything or not Remix, uh, React Router ignores everything after preview. It'll just throw it all to us and we'll just forward it on to the iframe. So it's it's fine, but I, I don't know what other scenarios we might get into there. Right. Something something to be mindful of. Yeah. Cool. 